Today we're going to move on from uh, basically continuum linear elasticity theory and talk today about um, one of my favorite topics in polymers. And unfortunately, we don't, we're not going to be able to just talk too much about this, but um, basically linear viscoelasticity. So we've dealt with continuum isotropic linear elasticity. That's kind of all the equations we worked with. We briefly talked about anisotropic linear elasticity. So when, you know, basically when we were dealing with this guy, which we did not want to solve, uh, who would want to with these 81 components, this fourth rank tensor. Uh, that is not nice. Um, but, and all these modes of differentiation are independent of time, rate, and temperature. But lots of materials, especially polymers, um, they're basically uh, going to behave like a viscoelastic material. So viscoelastic can be broken into two terms. So vis visco, which is viscous, and elastic. So you're going to have basically a uh, behavior that's somewhere in between an elastic solid and a viscous fluid. Um, so there's going to be basically an elastic response that is going to behave Hookian, so Hooke's law, and there's going to be a viscous response that's going to be described by this equation here. Um, this type of uh, behavior is very common for a lot of different material, um, and you're going to kind of see this again for polymers, glasses, tissue cells. So hopefully you've seen this equation before if you've taken a fluids class. So when you shear a material, uh, you apply some known shear stress, you could relate that to the strain rate. The shear strain rate here. So this dot denotes uh, basically a rate term. So it's your change in shear divided by time. That is going, or not divided by time, but partial. That is uh, basically that dot denotes a time derivative. So you know that when you have a basically, you know, you can relate the shear stress if you have kind of these two walls and you have like a fluid in between here, and you shear basically this material, so you push this way, you push this way, you can relate essentially the shear that you place on it, the viscosity, this is your viscosity, your fluid, viscosity, to the strain rate uh, at which that uh, material flows, basically. Uh, so that is your fluid viscosity. If it's a, uh, basically if it's a material that is Newtonian, this, uh, this value will not uh, basically change. Uh, if it's not Newtonian, you get into kind of some really uh, interesting behavior. So where the viscosity uh, basically changes as a function of, so your viscosity changes as a function of your strain rate there. Um, so that is some non, that's a basically non-Newtonian fluid. That's a topic for another class. But anyways, uh, there are lots uh, of ways that you could kind of describe uh, essentially the viscoelastic behavior of polymers. One of the best ways, or one of the first ways is kind of by developing, uh, basically looking at kind of the viscous component and the spring component by approximating your material as this kind of series or um, this connection of these springs and dash plot, either in series or in parallel. So you'll basically create these Maxwell and Voigt models where you either have, again, your, this is your elastic term. This is your viscous term. So your dash pot is here. Your spring is here. So again, a viscoelastic response. So there's some elastic response. There's some viscous response. You could kind of uh, model materials based on whether, uh, uh, on their behavior, you could connect these in series, you can connect these in parallel, like you see in the Voigt model here, and you can essentially describe uh, the equations, um, which govern essentially the elastic or, you know, your mechanical response. Um, so you can read through this in the notes. Again, if you need a link to the OER, please let me know. Um, so uh, you could kind of go through a lot when you're in spring. Uh, when you're in series, you can see that the stress in your whole unit is the same, but obviously you know, the strain is different. When you're in parallel, uh, it's the opposite. The strains are equal, but you're, and you can kind of see that for, uh, from the previous page, right? So here they're physically attached. So if I pull on this material, this component and this component are gonna have the same strain. Here, if I pull on this component and this component, it's feeling the same stress here. So when you're in series, uh, you're, you feel the same stress. The stresses are equal in your, uh, basically, the dash pot and the spring. If you're in parallel, the strain is the same in your dash pot and the spring. Um, but anyways, you could get, uh, you could kind of approximate and you could uh, kind of basically estimate or kind of create these kind of really complex models to, uh, again, describe essentially the mechanical sp response of materials. Um, specifically, you can do these two types of tests. So stress relaxation, where you apply a constant strain, and creep, where you apply a constant stress. We're gonna talk a lot about this uh, a little bit later on in kind of the uh, plasticity. Um, and specifically, we're gonna talk about creep in terms of 
uh, how it changes as a function of high temperature, high temperature regimes. So much more on this later. We're going to uh, develop um, deformation mechanism maps. So look forward to that. Deformation mechanisms, mechanism maps. So that is your stress relaxation. You could, again, you, uh, you could apply constant stress. You could kind of solve these expressions and see how the stress changes as a function of time. Um, but uh, these are great models, but again, um, they're just models. So in order to really kind of approximate and kind of understand the material properties uh, for any kind of general uh, viscoelastic material, there's a kind of a better test that you can do. And this is, uh, I really like to kind of talk about this topic, dynamic mechanical testing. So essentially what you do here is you apply, uh, you can kind of imagine you have a uh, kind of almost like in the DSC curve, you have like this cylinder or whatever, you know, and you have some material inside here, some viscoelastic material. It could be a polymer. It could be a gel. Uh, who knows? It could be a biomaterial. Uh, it could be a glass even too. Um, gel, biomaterial. And what you do is you kind of take this like plunger and you kind of press it, you know, this kind of cylinder. You press it down and we're going to apply basically a sinusoidal like twist and rotation. Uh, and we're going to apply basically the sinusoidally varying stress. Then we are going to measure what is the uh, resulting, essentially, strain in this material. So we're going to apply this uh, sinusoidal stress. There's going to be some sinusoidally varying strain. And you're going to kind of measure, uh, uh, basically, after that, the material is going to experience uh, some stress from this strain here. So... This stress is going to have kind of these uh, two unique forms. So one, uh, and there's going to be kind of some phase lag, essentially, that's going to be introduced. So again, because it's a viscoelastic, there's going to be some quick response, you know, uh, so some immediate response that's elastic, and there's going to be basically a viscous response that's going to lag somewhat. So you can kind of imagine, right, if you pull a spring, it's going to respond instantaneously. The dash pot, you're pulling it through that viscous fluid, so it's going to take some time to kind of mechanically respond. So... You're going to have some component of the stress that we measure for our material. There's going to be part of it that's going to be in phase. So in phase with the stress. And there's going to be one part that's going to be out of phase. Out of phase. This is going to be your elastic response in phase. Because again, if you apply that sinusoidally varying stress, so if you apply that uh, stress, and if it's in phase, it's basically responding almost instantaneously. And I think I have a nice little figure to show that. Uh, that's in the, unfortunately in another lecture. Um, so let's go back here. Uh, the out of phase is going to be your viscous response. So these are just trig functions. So the storage, or the, you know, you're, you could write this basically. Uh, you could rewrite the stress up here. Uh, and divide out by the E naught, and we could divide a storage modulus or an elastic modulus, which is the in phase contribution. You could do the loss modulus, which is your out of phase contribution. Uh, again, the viscous response here, and you'll eventually. Uh, this is kind of a lost tangent. You could read more about this, but you end up with this really, really, really nice and powerful plot um, that shows uh, G prime, or you can kind of rewrite this as E prime as well. P prime and so, here. This is a curve of the storage modulus uh, and loss modulus as a function of frequency. Now, this is a really, really, really important parameter in materials, uh, in polymers, and in when you're kind of dealing with viscoelastic materials. So, you can tell basically when a material, at what frequencies a material is going to behave like a solid, and what materials can behave like a liquid. So, we know that uh, E double prime, G double prime, this is our viscous response. This is our elastic response. The, the behavior is going to dominate by whichever curve is higher. So there's a crossover point here. This is going to be important in a second. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later. But to the left of this curve, on this side, which behavior is dominating? The viscous. So to the left of this curve, E double prime is dominating. Our viscous term dominates. Why is that? Well, you could kind of imagine at low frequencies, when we apply a, a stress that has low frequencies or 
basically, uh, you could even think of a strain rate that is very low. You're basically, you know, slowly, you know, kind of turning that knob uh, or kind of, you know, twisting your sample. The viscous response dominates because, again, you're allowing that material time to kind of relax and flow. Um, a great example of this is like a, a silly putty. So if you pull silly putty really, really slow, it kind of flows like a liquid. If you pull silly putty really, really fast, high frequency stress, it will actually kind of break like a solid. Or if you cool in temperature as well. If you put silly putty in, uh, it's a nice, uh, really fun demo. If you put a silly putty in, um, in liquid nitrogen and throw it against a wall, it'll shatter. But if you raise temperature, it will all, uh, it'll flow like a liquid. So at low frequencies, the viscous response dominates. At high frequencies on this side, E prime dominates. Our elastic response dominates for the exact same reasons. When you stress or you know you pull something really, 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 really fast at super high frequencies, you're not allowing it time to relax. The viscous response is basically going to disappear, and you're just going to have a, almost a purely elastic response. So to the left or right, we could kind of tell at what frequencies is the material going to behave more like a viscous fluid, or is it going to behave more like an elastic solid? And this point, this crossover point here. That frequency is a very special term. This is the characteristic relaxation time of material. So that is a frequency. So the time, you'll just kind of see this often as a tau star. It's just going to be 1 over, you know, let's call this 1 over omega star. Because omega is going to be our frequency. So 1 over hertz. Hertz is inverse second, so this will give us our relaxation time. So this is the amount of time that a polymer or, you know, uh, kind of one of these viscoelastic materials needs to kind of relax and rearrange. Uh, if you go higher or kind of shorter in time, um, you're not allowing the polymer to kind of relax and rearrange uh, kind of its structure. Um, so that is a very, very, very important uh, uh, property of polymers uh, that you'll kind of see in this uh, analysis. One last thing before we kind of um, leave it, unfortunately, again, if you're interested in this material, I have um, basically another OER, um, and I'll, I could give you some notes from my, uh, my graduate polymer course. Um, unfortunately, we don't have too much time to talk about this, but uh, it's a really, really kind of cool uh, topic. And again, it's, it's described pretty well in the notes here, but if you, need, uh, if you want more information, I'll be happy to provide it. Um, before we take off, um, in addition to viscoelastic material, uh, composites are... Um, kind of closely associated with it. So composites are kind of the new material of the future. So we're combining basically more than one type of material. So you'll typically see like some type of particle form or fibers, precipitates, you know, carbon fibers, you know, in an epoxy matrix or, you know, uh, carbon nanotubes in, you know, epoxy, you know, you, you kind of see this all, you know, composites are again, you know, the new material of the future because it, it combines essentially high stiffness uh, with a lower density of material. Um, so it's very, you know, attractive for cars or aerospace, where basically you want to kind of have the same mechanical behavior, lower density, lower, um, uh, lower density, so that you don't consume more fuel. So if I have a composite, a composite can be made of two components, the matrix, so the majority component, usually this is the less stiff material, and then the, the precipitate or the fiber or whatever, you know, the mi minority component, which is usually much stiffer. So this is typically going to be like your carbon fiber. And this could be like your, you know, basically your uh, epoxy, you know, uh, kind of something. You typically see that. Now, you can pull, uh, and actually we could see in this next image, you can pull the composite. So if you have, you know, this is kind of your typical uh, uh, com composition of a composite. So you have fibers and you have matrix. Uh, again, they could be, you know, uh, you'll have fibers that sometimes they have different directions because obviously if you align the fibers differently, uh, it's going to change. Basically, you're adding, you know, some rotation, some theta, where you're kind of changing the rotation of uh, your stress state. So that could be advantageous in certain applications. Um, but let's say in this case, you have all your fibers kind of aligned in this direction. You can pull longitudinally or you can pull transverse to that fiber direction. So if you pull... Um, uh, if you pull along that longitudinal uh, direction, uh, you can see. Uh, yeah, let, let's uh, yeah, let's look here. Um, longitudinal direction of the fibers. Uh, let's say it's let's say it's tra uh, transverse with respect to longitudinal axis direction. So let's say we're pulling right here. If we're pulling across there, our stresses are 
the same. But our uh, strains are going to be different here. So the total strain in your composite, again, you just kind of rewrite the equation. This is very similar to kind of what we saw with the Maxwell, uh, Maxwell and Voigt models. You're going to rewrite this uh, uh, the strain of your total composite here because, again, if you're pulling along the transverse direction, if you make kind of a cut here, your stress is going to be the same, whether you're pulling on the matrix or you're pulling on, uh, you know, because you're kind of making your cut, remember, making your cut kind of along this direction. So the cross-sectional area is the same for the fiber and for the uh, matrix. Um, so what you end up having is the Young's modulus of your composite in that, in that transverse direction is this. This is transverse. If you're pulling in the longitudinal direction, now your cut is like this, the area is no longer the same. So your strains are the same, but now, because again, they're kind of attached here, you're kind of pulling along the same direction. Instead, your stresses are going to be different. And that will change your stiffness of the, that composite. So what happens is you have this difference of the stiffness of your composite is going to change the, uh, depending on the fraction of fibers, obviously. So as you increase the fraction of, you know, your kind of stiffer material, obviously the stiffness increases. But if you're pulling axially, so along, so if I'm pulling axially, I'm pulling along the fiber direction. So my fibers are like this. This is my stiffness of my composite. If I'm pulling transverse, here's the stiffness of my composite. So again, depending on how you uh, arrange your composite, how you arrange the, uh, basically how you're pulling on the composite or how you uh, organize your fibers, a direction at which you, you know, kind of implant them in the composite, you will change the mechanical properties of your material. So uh, if you're interested more in the composites, uh, especially um, this comes into play, uh, basically, you know, a, a, a composite is an anis linear anisotropic material. So you will really change essentially that properties. You're going to have to work with, um, to describe that material or the mechanical response, you're going to have to work with this tensor. And it gets much, it gets pretty complicated very quickly. Um, but again, I have notes that kind of cover that. So if you're interested, please let me know. And yeah, next time we're getting into finally our uh, yield criteria, specifically ranking Tresca and Von Mises yield criteria. So I'll see you all next time. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.